Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for Carousel Chats Painting. Carousel Chats are a free virtual program series presented by the Herschel Carousel Factory Museum. They consist of presentations from experts in the amusement field and then a question and answer session. If you have any questions for your presenters tonight, please drop them in the Q&A or in the chat. This program is made possible by the Museum Association of New York Building Capacity Grant. Joining us tonight, we have Carousel Restoration Specialist, Rosa Patton, Helen Ronan from the Buffalo Heritage Carousel, and Morgan Ergo, Executive Director of the New England Carousel Museum. First up is Rosa Patton. Are you ready for me? Yep. Okay. So screen share. Um, okay. All right, I started at the wrong end here. Let me go back. There we go. All right, I'm gonna speak on how I plan colors for a carousel. And I've done this a lot over the years. Um, and I just want to start out by giving a warning of sorts that I think the, the other two speakers are also going to echo. And that is when you disturb original paint or any paint on a carousel animal, if the paint was put on before 1978, you are disturbing uh, lead, sometimes mercury, sometimes arsenic. So if you're going to try any of the things that we talk about, if it disturbs uh, the paint or even the wood, the, the lead has permeated the wood, you need to do your research um, and look at uh, the EPA website is a good place to start. And I think they have um, a section called how to protect your family. And children are the main concern and you can take this, this lead dust and stuff home on your clothes and pass it on to your children. So that's all I'm gonna say about that, but it is very, very important that you do your research and that you wear the right protective equipment when you are disturbing old lead paint, whether it's on a carousel or in your house or anywhere. So how I plan colors for a carousel. Um, the first two projects that I worked on 44 years ago uh, involved finding original factory paint and reproducing that on a repainting. The first one was the carousel, the Denzel carousel at Pullen Park, which is this giraffe in Raleigh, North Carolina, which this giraffe is from. And I became really interested in that. And so over the last 44 years, um, that has been my main interest uh, is original paint. So my goal in planning any color on an antique carousel um, is to reproduce historically accurate color decoration and design. And why does color, matter, color planning matter? Um, it provides a coherent historic look and feel to a carousel just like the carving does. Uh, and it provides another element of authenticity. Uh, and it, a well thought out color plan can make the, the carousel look um, really harmonious um, by repeating colors uh, around and over the carousel because usually um, color palettes for a carousel aren't very large. You don't have that many colors on it. So you repeat the same ones and it works really well. Um, one thing that I want to say about um, carousel companies is that Every carousel company had a distinct style of carousel design and carving. And they also had a distinct style of painting. Uh, they had uh, unique color palettes, each one, and they had a specific set of materials that they used for painting and decorating. And these two animals here, one is a PTC horse with original paint from Burlington, Colorado. And the, the one on the right is just a black and white catalog photograph of an Allen Herschel Company horse. And you can see the difference, not only in the style of carving, but uh, the horse on the left is the body colors are perfectly blended. Um, 
the designs are very small. And on the right, the Alan Herschel horse is the colors on the body are a little less blended. Um, and you can see some of the type of design that they put on the saddles and the blanket. So they're very different, even the paint job. Uh, some companies like this uh, little Luth horse that I cleaned down to original paint. When I say clean down to original paint, that means that I, that I removed layers and layers and layers sometimes of old park paint, park paint that was just slapped on there over the years. Uh, this little horse, I mean, some of, some of the companies used um, gold and silver metallic leaf and some didn't. Um, and some used simple, uh, inexpensive materials and others, um, you know, leaf especially, there is very, um, I think the carousel companies that were on um, Coney Island or, or in New York were, they used a lot of gold and silver like Illions and Luth and all, all of those guys. They used um, more silver and gold than the Philadelphia people did. So they're all different. The date that the carousel uh, was made determines the style, sometimes on colors and decorative techniques. You can see the Denzel Company horse on the left and the Denzel Company horse on the right. The one on the left, the colors were kind of muted and um, not real, I would say glitzy. The only glitzy thing on here is, is the, the um, the jewels that they added. But on the right, uh, the Denzel Company by 1921 was using a lot of glazed aluminum leaf uh, and it made it uh, sort of glitzy and shiny and um, eye-catching really. Tools for color planning are, that I use, uh, are color exploration and results and re research, excuse me, and I have developed over the years, and you can develop your own if you wanted, an archive for color and decoration made up of reference photos, materials, and collected information. I just looked, went downstairs and looked before this talk, and I have drawers of tracings and plans of pen striping and designs that I collected off of the original paint or that I've drawn myself that are similar to the original paint. I have a drawer of it little tracings and plans. Um, one other tool is a color palette. And I think that's very important and color notes and sketches. I wanna start out with Glen Echo, um, planning the color uh, on a carousel with original paint by documenting pa and painting one piece at a time. This carousel I restored over a 20 year period. And that is because it belongs to the park service and they didn't do, some years they didn't do anything. And then finally, the last parts of the carousel were done within a couple of years. So I had to find and document the original paint on each piece uh, or each two or three pieces, whatever I had at the time. And I did that by cleaning um, windows down to the original paint. And you have to realize that this carousel, before it was restored, it was covered in about 10 layers of paint. So I cleaned with an X-Acto knife down to the original layer of paint um, and matched the color, uh, did tracings of the designs, whatever. If I saw or I expected there to be a design, a special design in a certain area, if I could see little pieces of it, uh, I would clean a larger area and I would actually put tracing paper over it and trace it so that I could reproduce it when I repainted these because these were uh, coated and repainted. The original paint was not taken off, but it was sealed up and repainted. Uh, the colors that I found were matched to uh, the colors in the Munsell Book of Color and notated in lists and sketches and photos. The photo on the left is a piece of the band organ 
the Wolitzer style 165 band organ. The park service required me to document every layer of paint ever put on every the animals and the band organ. So that's what the one, two, three, four, five is. Number one is the original paint, number two, the next, number three, the next, number four, next. So they were all, all the sample areas were done like that. And I would do about 50 sample areas on each horse. Uh, this is a, the, on the photo on the right is a sketch that I did of a rounding board piece. And you can see I've got color notations written all over it of where the original paint was found. This is a tracing that I took off of a Glen Echo saddle. Um, so I did tracings of all of the, uh, the designs that I found, big and small. And I have them all in my little drawer. I have all these, these things that I've saved over the years. And I sometimes use them on other dental animals from the same time period. Uh, like I said, each horse had to have its own color, color palette. So I sometimes did a kind of a working drawing um, little watercolor with colors. And the notation you see beside red, for example, 7.5 R412 is from the Munsell Book of Color, which is very organized uh, way of matching color. Uh, the gathered information was used to, on the left, repaint uh, the horses and the animals. And on the right, this ceiling panel was covered with, I think, four or five layers of paint. And I managed to clean it down to the original paint, and it was touched up. So all the ceiling, the, all the 18 ceiling panels, I did that way, and they were big, big job. Uh, the band organ. Uh, was also covered with, as you saw on that piece that I showed you, with five, at least five layers of paint. So it was all cleaned down to the original. And the scroll work was repainted according to what I found on the original layer. Another way to collect uh, color samples from the original paint that I've done many times as well is to collect all of the color samples at one time on the whole carousel. And so you might spend a week or two weeks or whatever it takes. And you organize your sample areas like you see on the, on the drawing on the left. Uh, I think all of the F samples were body colors. All of the A samples, as you can see on the right photo, were bridal samples. And so I have a, a way of organizing it and a map, basically, to show me where I got each sample. Uh, this is a, a different carousel than the one I just showed you, but um, it just, same thing. You do in areas where you know there might be a design or you see a design, you do further cleaning and a tracing. So this is on a Ilium Supreme. Um, you take all the colors that you find, and this is where the Munsell Book of Color helps because on the right, you can see the color chips from that color book and you can pull them out and um, make your color, uh, your color palette. Um, a lot of times I'll do that and then I'll take that down to my local paint store and just um, match them up to paint chips from a, you know, a commercial paint company. But I do sketches of the pieces, um, sometimes watercolor, sometimes not, sometimes just notes. Here's a couple of little watercolors. The one on the left is um, New York State Museum Carousel in Albany. And one on the right is the B&B Carousel in Brooklyn. But all these were, all of the color samples were taken at one time and then you, take all of that, all the information that, that you get, your tracings and organize that. And this is about color on carousels that have no original paint. Then you have to assemble an archive uh, and you do the color planning using information from other similar carousels, meaning 
carousels from the same time period from the same company. And animals frequently do not survive with original paint on them, uh, showing anyway, you have to clean park paint off to get to it. So I'm gonna show you just a few uh, kinds of things that I would have in an archive that I do have in a or uh, photo archive of um, original paint. One on the left is from Meridian, Mississippi. One on the right is from a private collection. Two Denzel horses from very different time periods from Denzel with original paint. A Denzel tiger and a PTC zebra, both in private collections with original paint. Now, you could have four or five good photos of original paint from, say, a Denzel carousel. The time in the time period of this dental tiger, and you have a good color palette started right there. If you take, if you match all the colors that you find on those five photographs, you've got a good start right there. Dental horse with original paint and an original design on the chariot back at Glen Echo. So just, this is just a photo archive that I could use on another carousel um, if I happen to be restoring one. You can find other carousels with original factory paint. Um, the one uh, upper left is uh, from a loof rounding board that has still, all the rounding boards on that loof have original paint. One on the right, the lion, lioness, uh, that carousel is in Burlington, North Carolina, and they actually cleaned that down to the original paint. One on the bottom left is from Jane's Carousel in Brooklyn, and I believe they left that, uh, she cleaned it, Jane cleaned that down to the original paint, and I think they left that without repainting it. They did repaint the other animals. And this, I think, is a treasure trove of information. This is Tremper's Carousel in Ocean City, Maryland. Uh, and I want you to especially look in about in the middle of the photograph, there is a, what we're calling balances, Helen, um, that run from one, um, that spread from one of the, what do you call those things that go out? Anyway, it's in the middle here with the flower on it. And the one at the Buffalo Heritage Carousel was missing those. And so what we did was I made a pattern that you can see in the upper left. And Todd Goings, who did a lot of the work on that carousel, cut them out and I painted them and they hang on the Buffalo Heritage Carousel. So that's, that was a fun project. Another place you can get uh, old photos is from books and calendars that have pieces of, with original paint in them. Black and white photos. You can learn a lot from a black and white photo of a horse. You can see the pinto uh, about right in the middle of this photo and you can see Ilians was known for using making gold leaf manes. Well, you can see those gold leaf manes there, even though it's not gold. And you, even it's not in color, but it's very shiny, definitely gold leaf. And you can see other shiny parts that was, Ilians was known to use a lot of glazed aluminum. And you can see that there. And that's another Ilians promo photo. You can see the mane, the gold on the mane, the dappling. And this is uh, an Alan Herschel carousel. Again, you can see um, how they painted bodies. And, I've, and looking at these, I've, I've never really noticed that they look like they had white around their eyes, all of them. Um, I've never painted one that way, but you, you've also got the scenery panels. Um, you can see what the landscapes, at least what the subject matter was and what kind of paintings they put in the center of the carousel. 
photos from old cat catalogs from carousel companies. I believe this is a Herschel Spillman or Spillman Engineering catalog. But again, you can see the dappling. You can see some of the pinstriping, a little bit of design here and there. There's a lot to be learned from these. And this I always show because this is the way Densel painted dapples. Very bold. And this is from the Densel Company. Um, and I think it's interesting that the blanket on this horse looks like it is blended color. And most of Densel um, paintings, the, all of the trappings were just flat color. This is from an old photo of Alan Herschel Carousel Factory. Um, so archival photos are good and you can clearly see the design painted on this black horse in the foreground. Uh, and you can see way in the foreground where you can just see part of a saddle. You can definitely see pinstriping. And so all of these are very useful in trying to determine um, what carousels look like, historic carousels. Again, another Illions with gold leaf manes. And the one on the right, the horse on the right looks like it's a uh, pinto. So you can see how that's painted. You can get inf information from other restorers. Uh, the photo on the left is uh, Susan Price Hopsis who, um, was an owner of Seabreeze Park, is an owner of Seabreeze Park in Rochester um, 25, 30, 30 years ago, restored their, their Philadelphia toboggan carousel. Unfortunately, that carousel burned, but she cleaned down to the original paint and this is what she found and reproduced. And the, the one on the right, uh, Lisa Leitman out in California, cleaned this PTC lion down to the original paint. And I think it is a stunning example of the paint job. Uh, the next is planning color for, and the last is planning a color for a newly carved carousel. And this is the Loon Point Carousel, privately owned in Maine, uh, designed and carved by Ed Roth. Todd Goings was contractor. I spec the colors, the trim painters, People who painted the rounding boards in the trim or carousel, and car at car Todd Goings carousel and carvings. And I painted the band organ, the animals, and the chariots. And I plant, yeah, plant the color. So the first thing, if you have a new carousel, you can do anything you want. But if it is, a, if it's carvings that are historically based, I still try to, um, use historic colors. But the first thing is to make a basic color plan, plan for the carousel. And this, unfortunately, I couldn't find. The carousel map here is for a different carousel. I couldn't find the map that I made for the Loon Point carousel. But I'll basically figure out what animals are going to be what color and try not to get uh, too much blue in one area or too much green in another area on the carousel. And then I make or I'll say get a color palette because for Loon Point, the color palette that's on the extreme right, which I walked into Home Depot and picked up a flyer, a, a pamphlet, a color pamphlet brochure. And I thought, I like these colors. These are the ones I'm gonna use. So I didn't have to do any historic anything. Uh, the top is uh, the upper trim for Lone Point Carousel and the bottom is the color specifications that I sent up to carousel, carousels and carvings to paint that. And so I used, um, you know, all the colors that I picked out from the, uh, the color chart. And here's a watercolor sketch that I did for the bear at Lone Point. And there's the bear. And you can see Scooter, the little teddy bear sitting up on the front leg of the bear. This, this carving was for the owner's daughter. And that was her teddy bear. She's grown and has her own children now. And I sent Scooter back. So I guess her children have him. 
And I was gonna say that photos from real life can also help you paint carousel animals that are, especially ones that are new. And I always refer to, I have a horse book of different colors of horses when I paint any horse, whether it's old or new, I still look at the, it's, whether it's an antique one or a new one, I still look at horse photos. And here is my favorite one. And it shows, I didn't mention designs on new, newly carved pieces, but the little design up on the saddle, I developed myself just kind of using what I know about antique color designs. But you can see that I used photographs of turtles, box turtles when I painted this animal. So that's my take on color. That's it. Oh, Thanks, Rosa. That was a wonderful presentation. <laughs> All right, and now it Helen. It, sorry, it is Helen Ronan from the Buffalo Heritage Carousel. You're up. <laughs> I'm taking center stage. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. So sorry. Anyway. I wanna thank Marissa for inviting Buffalo Heritage Carousel to be a part of this program. It's, uh, it's a real honor. We're so new at this uh, thing that it's, um, it's nice to be part of the presentation. So I just, we started in April of 2017 when they delivered um, a truckload of pieces. And in many cases, um, some parts we recognized and some parts we didn't from a 1924 um, Spillman Engineering carousel that we had purchased from uh, the DeAngelis family, um, uh, which did not live around Buffalo, but they came to Buffalo to have a carousel built for his family. Um, so there they did, and that was way back in 1924. And over the years, um, with all the history of it, and you can obtain that history through buffaloheritagecarousel.org. And it has the history of the carousel. I am so sorry. Um, anyway. You can get the history of the carousel off of that because what I'm gonna talk about is the restoration process for the 1924 Spillman Engineering Menagerie Park model carousel. That's a real mouthful, but it's so worth it. Um, so anyway, we um, had the arrival of our uh, carousel in pieces and it was a puzzle. Um, we had a workshop in North Tonawanda for which we did all of the uh, stripping of the paint and sanding of the paint, the carving of the different pieces that had to be replaced. And uh, we would end up with, then after all of that, it, we had a, a room just for painting. And that was awesome to be able to work that way. So I'm gonna show you a picture of how some of them arrived. And if you can imagine those pictures all over a floor, which measured about um, 20 by 24, that's a lot of pieces and a lot of horses and a lot of animals, but it was great. Um, so it was quite the challenge for us to get to uh, put those all together. So uh, we, were, we, we received, the, all the carousel and everything. And then our job was to go out and get volunteers. And uh, we had a couple of volunteers uh, to help unload the uh, carousel pieces and parts. And uh, from those two uh, volunteers became part of the working team that we had. And they did the layout on the floor. And then um, from there, we um, would develop the puzzle complete the puzzle, as you would say. 
in order to proceed with the restoration, we needed a master carver by which we hired a Patrick Stanzik. He was a master carver for, to our luck from North Tonawanda. He's done a much, much carving throughout the country, but he's um, quite the professional. And he taught some talented volunteers to carve, carve, and carve some more. <laughs> Once the puzzle pieces were back in place for our next step was to remove all the old paint from all the pieces. To, this, to do this, it was decided that the heat gun process was best for our carousel. We really didn't wanna use chemicals, if at all possible. We did have to use chemicals on, I think two, maybe three of the pieces, but for some reason that paint got very stubborn and it wouldn't come off without using that. And I know one of them was the giraffe, but that worked out to our benefit. Um, so with that said, Patrick had to hire somebody that professionally could remove the paint. And we didn't want to have volunteers doing it. Uh, at that point, we wanted them to get used to doing the other steps that we had going. So he hired Rose Kirsch. And Rose is very, very professional at removing, <clears throat> removing the paint with the heat gun. She also spe paid special attention to the um, process by which this heat gun uh, was used by adhering to the OSHA requirements with the respirator that she wore every time she was in the, uh, in the room where the stripping of the paint was done and a full body garb, which protects her from any lead or any other foreign uh, product that come off of these horses because all of ours, all of these horses and animals were in the age of the lead and all that that pertains to. So with um, Rose, with, uh, I'm sorry, Rose Hirsch um, had removed all the paint layer by layer and um, she developed each, she did archiving as she went along. She did photos and she, um, with the, car, with the uh, removing of the different uh, layers of paint, she uh, put that into an archive for us, for each horse, each animal, and each carousel that we developed on uh, this carousel. Rosa or Rose achieved each uh, horse or archived each horse, animal, and chariot with description of photographs um, for future use. If it will be a possibility for us to apply for historic preservation status, that we're still hanging on to because that's one thing that uh, was something we wanted to do from day one when we purchased our carousel. Um, at that, this point, um, I'm going to show you, uh, well, we started filling cracks, um, applying epoxy to adhere newly carved pieces such as hooves, ears, teeth, and et cetera, uh, to any damaged areas of the horses and uh, animals. Uh, then we began the sanding and sanding and more sanding. When the sanding was completed many weeks later, and at least we thought it was done, we applied paints of um, different primers. Our first coat was, uh, first two coats was an alcohol-based white sealer called Ben. That's B-I-N. And um, that first coat of uh, Ben would always bring out more cracks or, or cracks we didn't see or dents or uh, little things that we had to go back and work with. And um, with that, we have this picture showing the little blue tapes 
um, that marked some of those. Now, it's very hard to see that at this point from where you're sitting, but we knew it when the moment you walked into the workshop and saw those tapes, for which I was one of them responsible for placing those tapes, that that was more sanding. So that's what we did, and we kept going until we got the product of this horse with no um, dents that we could detect. So then, um, after the two coats and sanding in between of Ben, we moved along to two coats, or I'm sorry, three coats of a primer, and that's an oil-based primer. And um, hopefully at that point, we didn't see anything that we needed to sand, but you just never did know whether there was something stuck in the crevice of like in the, on the tack work and all that. So you always kept that sanding um, uh, block and different things available if we had to go back and touch and keep working at that. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of the four stages and the end product. This is of our deer. And it shows where we kind of put him together. We kind of put him, uh, fix that puzzle on him. And then uh, that's when Rosa came in and she and Lori hire Laduca, which is a president of our board, uh, designed the color scheme for everything. And uh, the gentleman that you see in the end product down there, a picture, is the gentleman that donated us the antlers, which are authentic ant antlers that he had gotten from one of his hunts, one of his first hunts, and he donated those to us. So we are very privileged to have those on display. We're also extremely protective of them. When we see a purse hanging on them, we really, we really step in and get the purse off of the antlers. So, and here we have uh, an original chair. Uh, this is the chariot that was um, original to the carousel. It's the only original one that we were able to put back on it. So we stripped all the paint, we did all of the uh, necessary work that was needed uh, to get it to where we could paint. And this was one of the, one of the real precious uh, pieces that we worked on. When we stripped off the back of the chariot, uh, we were able to find the original um, Hen striping that was done in a goldenrod color. And that you'll notice in there that that was a maroon color of a chariot and with a goldenrod uh, color on it. So, what we did was take pictures. And as Rosa taught us, we did tracings and we were able to replicate the exact um, color exact pinstriping as we move forward with it. So we're real proud of that one. We had two other chariots for which uh, Carousel Carvings designed us one for our ADA compliant chariot so that we can let our, um, let our persons of, uh, with disabilities ride in their wheelchairs. Uh, in there and we can strap them in and they can have the same ride that everybody else gets. And the uh, carousel uh, carvings also did a, um, a rocking gondola and that is an awesome piece. And Rosa did those for us. And then this is our uh, tiger for, I'm sorry, this tiger or lion? It's a tiger. <laughs> anyway, this one just shows you from the beginning where we started with the stripping and got it all down to the finished product here. And when we started painting, just a couple little tips that we liked 
Um, and we started uh, this from the day one when people would come in and want to be a volunteer. It was something we were looking for. We wanted people to feel free to come in and we would help them in any way they wanted to be a volunteer with us. So we designed a program where you would start with the sanding and the filling and all of the work from day one, from where that horse starts. They didn't have to do any stripping of the paint. We kept that um, safeguarded, but they would have to do that. If people weren't willing to start with the sanding, then we asked, we told them that it really can't be part of the process. Um, not that we wanted to turn anyone down, but there was a reason for that. We want everybody to know the beginning and the end of the project. So uh, we had, I had about 15 dedicated uh, volunteers. The next thing that we did with that, uh, another tip that I can hand out to people is that when we started painting, proprietor, pr owning of the horse was not permitted. Nobody could paint just one horse. Everybody rotated. Uh, when they would come every, and every other day, whatever, they would go to a different horse. And the reason for that was we were doing a, a checking each other's painting as we went along. Everybody has a different set of eyes. And with all of that, it was very important that we had everybody looking at everything as an overall picture. And it worked out very well. Uh, certain people had certain expertises, but some people didn't and they just went along with the flow and if you ever get a chance to come to Buffalo, please stop in and see. We're really proud of it. And that's the end of my little speech. Any questions? Sorry, Ellen, I'm just trying to figure out a, oh, there we go. I'm there we are. spotlight from you. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. And the carousel is very beautiful. I've been there before. Um, so definitely if you're in Buffalo, stop down there and then come up to North Tonawanda and come see us yes. at the PM. <laughs> and now it is time for executive director of the New England Carousel Museum, Morgan Ergo. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna do this here. And come on, there we go. Well, thank you. Thank you again, both uh, Helen and Rosa. It's an honor to be uh, in presenting with the both of you, as well as Marissa in the Herschel Museum. So excited to be here. Um, I'm going to know if uh, we're going to start with um, our restoration department and uh, the painting department, but we're going to focus really on the tools and materials. So if you're interested in doing this, um, I'm going to share how we do it. We have a little bit of a different method than um, some other restorers. And uh, it's just some some tips and helpful hints for how how we work here. And I'm happy I have my email at the end if anybody has any interest in getting a list of the materials that I talk about. Um, I'm happy to share that as well as the PowerPoint presentation as well. So um, this is our building. If you haven't yet been to um, the Carousel Museum in Bristol, Connecticut, um, it's a 33,000 square foot facility. Uh, we have the main gallery on the first floor, and then we have our ballroom and our restoration department on the second floor. So it's a big facility. It takes about three hours, I think, for people. I always say I take people on the, the Gilligan's Isle three hour tour when they come here, so they don't let me give tours anymore. <laughs> so um, this is me. This is my favorite picture. This is me on a on a regular work day <laughs> out in Fresno trying to bring the the band organ back from California. But um, and I also wanted to spotlight Lisa Renalter, who is our new um, not new master painter, but she has recently been promoted to master painter. She's been an apprentice here at the museum for 18 years. Um, her mother in law, Judith Baker, was our master painter prior to that, who was here for almost 30 years. Um, and Judy has recently retired and Lisa has stepped up. So we're um, very fortunate to have both of these women in our life and uh, working, uh, working with the museum and, and getting us to where we are today. 
Um, two uh, major projects that we're working on right now is Sunny's Place in Summers, Connecticut. It's PTC Philadelphia Toboggan Company number 72. Um, this is them erecting and actually we worked as well with Todd Goings on this project. Um, he kind of built the, the mechanism and we have been restoring the animals since 2017. Uh, this guy behind me is number uh, six of last ones to go and there's another one and then after that there's only four more and the chariots and I'll be so excited to move on to doing uh, the in inner um, panels and things like that. The other, P the other full carousel that we're working on right now is the Lake Compounds carousel, which is about two minutes uh, from us. It is a 1895 Murphy Brothers <laughs> frame um, with a variety of uh, animals on it, but mostly mostly loof uh, pieces. Um, and this is Lisa working on uh, Peekaboo, who's the lead the lead horse on that. So we just began restoring that last year, and we hope to be able to continue that for the next couple of years. Um, we also have a variety of private pieces in. So we do about 24, um, 24 animals a year is typically um, what we try to shoot for. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a long process. It's a, it takes about three to 450 hours to restore. Um, we have an 82 step process from start to finish that we document pretty heavily. Um, and we're always learning. Even just before we started, I was asking Rosa and Helen certain things because we're always looking to see what other folks are doing, other restoration places are doing, other techniques that people are trying because it is a very labor intensive process. I do agree with Helen. It's countless hours of sanding, countless hours of documentation, um, but it's definitely a labor of love. Um, so I, we always say here, um, preparation is 99.9% .9 of getting to the painting and getting through to the painting. So, you know, making sure that you have your wood prepped and we'll talk a little bit about how we do that here at the museum. Um, but really patience and making sure that you have everything prepared and that you have everything ready to go, I think is the most important part of what I can say. It's like when you try to go to wallpaper something like, clean the walls, wipe everything down, get everything ready, prepare yourself, prep all the spaces um, and make sure that you're ready to, to before you do anything about putting paint on the surface. Um, setting yourself up for success, um, really thinking, you know, after years and years of doing this, we have modified just about anything in the world. Um, you know, I remember when I first started at the museum six years ago, um, Lisa would be rolling around on a yoga ball trying to get underneath the bellies and, um, you know, trying to, you know, just she had she had like a mechanics creeper so that she could like lay on her back and, and paint up above. And so I said, why don't we get a hydraulic lift? <laughs> And so we modified a hydraulic lift. We reinforced it on the bottom here. This is um, covered because we're um, getting ready to, to paint something else. I'm just moving you guys so I can see. Um, and we reinforced it with a steel plate. We um, welded uh, you know, a jumper pole here. This handle comes off. We also wrapped it with foam so you don't whack your shins on it, which I learned the hard way. Um, but this really, it only brings the horse up um, you know, maybe six inches or eight inches, but that's six or eight inches that you're not bending over to get the bellies. And so, you know, finding tricks and talking to other people about, you know, what's working for them or, you know, how do they do this? We also have been experimenting with a, a winch and a hoist and, and, you know, doing all different kinds of things. So as long as the, the animals are safe and the staff are safe, I think, you know, we're, we're trying all different ways to make this as comfortable and um, easy on everybody physically as possible. Um, cause none of us are getting any younger. That's for sure. <laughs> um, and then I know Rosa and Helen touched on this a little bit, but safety, make sure that you're wearing your respirators gloves when you, when you can, um, you know, if you're removing paint, you know, a, a full paint suit, you can also see behind here, um, during COVID, this is, um, the gentleman on the left, that's my husband. I enrolled him while he was on furlough <laughs> during COVID. So, you know, making sure that the ventilation systems are working there, you can see that there's fans circulating air um, and just, you know, protecting yourself. And I, and I highly agree, check out the EPA. If you're not sure, again, ask. And um, there are certainly a variety of carousel groups out there on Facebook and social media. I think everyone is willing to have this conversation and, and help people be successful at this. So we prepare the surface by um, using a shellac and we actually use this specific shellac. It's a Zinzer shellac. Um, we always here at the museum 
you know, do our best absolutely to get down to um, the uh, original paint. Most of the projects that we work on have already previously been restored and we know that. And so we know that when we remove the paint, um, we're going down to the bare wood um, and we want to keep an eye to the future, a future restoration. So we're hoping that, you know, the Lake Compounds Carousel is running for another hundred years and that when they go to do the restoration in another, another, you know, century or half century, that when they remove the paint, they are not going to go down and damage the wood. So we protect the wood by um, doing a shellac layer first. Um, and that just is with the hopes that the primer doesn't set right into the wood. Um, we also use um, a, uh, a uh, oil-based primer um, and that goes on uh, and we do several you know, versions of layers of that. And we do not pre uh, do the primer with um, a brush or a roller. We do it um, with a um, spray gun. And so we do that out of a spray gun because it leaves a really, you know, even uh, finish, but you have to kind of have some skill and you have to practice. So we have some new people in the restoration department and we're working on training them to do the spray gun um, with, uh, you know, on some other pieces um, before they they get to work on some of the restoration stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, um, you know, it's it's a balance. We try to do a minimum of, of three layers to, you know, like Helen was saying, like you, you reveal a lot of the imperfections in the wood when you do the primer layer. Um, and so we, we find that three or four layers of sanding and primer is usually about where we get catch all of our of our um, imperfections there. And then it does take a little bit of time for that to cure. And so we have a drying room. So once they are primered, they go to a clean drying room and they um, kind of hang out there for a week or two and make sure that they get really, really hard because we wanna make sure that the paint is really buffered from seep seeping into the primer down to the wood. And then, you know, a lot of what Rosa talks, you know, make a plan, like have, I know it's really exciting and I am the worst at this. So my background is as actually as an artist, I was uh, an, a museum educator for many, many years. And I just want to get in there and start painting. And Lisa's always telling me, hold on, we got to make our plan <laughs> and doing all of that. So she, she puts the rope, pulls the uh, you know, the seatbelt on me, but, you know, having a good plan, we, um, we actually print photos of the horses in primer and we do uh, a watercolor sketch. We are, um, a, a colored pencil sketch and, um, mark all of that out and gem placement, etc. Um, and then we make recipe cards that then are saved and put into a binder, which we save or give to the client should they, should they ask for it. Um, and, or we use historical photos, um, when we have that, um, have that option. Gold and aluminum leafing, we actually use, um, leafing from a company called Natural Pigments. Um, we use the RM, uh, gold leaf. It comes in booklets. Um, it's ranges between 30 and $50 for 24 sheets. Um, and you need a sizing, which is an adhesion material. Um, and that in itself, the gold leafing and aluminum leafing process is an art form in itself, I believe. It's, um, you know, you have to have timing and you kind of learn as you go. But um, again, it's, uh, it's a fairly straightforward process. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things that you need a little bit of, of uh, practice at. But um, I'm happy to share um, the sources for, for these as well. And we use um, 23 and a half carat gold leaf and we use aluminum leaf. We do not use or, co or copper leaf. We do not use silver leaf because we found that over the years it tarnishes much faster than the aluminum. Um, and we will do a base layer of a metallic paint underneath just in case sometimes the um, leafing doesn't stick or gets moved in the process. Um, it doesn't show through the white primer underneath. So you can kind of prep the prep the areas that you're doing the leafing with a metallic paint, and then um, do the doing the sizing and the gold, gold leafing over that. We always do the aluminum and and gold leafing first, um, and this is because we use um, an oil based paint. If you did the leafing afterwards, it gets very flaky and it will stick to all of your wet paint. <laughs> And so you have to do the, the, the leafing first and really let that dry. And then you work the paint in around, um, around the leafing. 
we are very fortunate to have a great partnership with several brush companies. Dynasty Brushes has been very generous to the museum and has donated um, for several years now. And um, their brushes are amazing quality and they come in a variety of um, textures and uh, stiffnesses and, and thicknesses and, and handles. And um, we're very, very fortunate to get to play with some of their new things um, as they come out. But um, we, we use these, these are very high quality brushes but we also use, um, oh, I'll talk about the other brushes after. And then we also have a relationship with the Mac brush company. So this blue one here is, um, is what we use for leafing and brushing away leaf. And then these big ones, believe it or not, even though they don't look like it, they are pinstriping brushes. When they get wet, they, they create this really fine, um, you know, pinstripe, uh, you know, tight line. And they have a variety of thick thicknesses. And they come from, you know, squirrel hair or camel hair, some very soft materials. But, um, you know, the MAC Brush Company has been really generous to us as well and has been um, supporting uh, the department here. And we, we really love their brushes. Um, and then we have a, um, you can see behind me, the blue tool chest um, is filled with all different kinds of drawers full of brushes. Um, and, you know, so that we have our dynasty brushes here, um, but then we have, you know, just chip chip brushes and the way that our um, restoration painting is applied is, um, is not a translucent um, process like more like Rosa does um, but we do um, it's a very kind of thick heavy um, you know primary color um, opaque process and the chip brushes are used to add textures and and, and add blending so it's just a it's a different it's a different style than um, some people use um, but we have we have so many brushes and it's not uncommon I'll walk in I grabbed I grabbed these and they'll be like Lisa will be like this and she'll have like 12 brushes in her <laughs> she'll be like this and then and then she'll be like i need an another brush so she's um got an assistant um an apprentice and he probably washes 50 to 100 brushes every evening just to make sure that you know everything is is clear because you know the oil um you know when you add the linseed and everything sometimes it can dry very quickly so you have to work very quickly and if a brush gets really loaded with paint you want to put it down grab a new one and, and move on at least that's our our process so we use um, the Ronin Japan oil paints and we use a linseed oil for, um, you know, mixing and blending. Um, Ronin is a company that up until I think 2017 was based in Brooklyn, New York. They have been in business since the turn of the century and um, they possibly could have been some of the paint um, that they used at the turn of the century to make carousels. They recently moved up the Hudson Valley, so they're they're located a little bit farther north now, um, but up until recently they were still based in, um, in Brooklyn. Um, and this is their color chart, and we um, tend to mix, um, you know, we don't over mix, we don't blend a lot of colors, we use a lot of color straight from this um, original um, color palette plan. Um, so you can see here, um, Lisa's working on uh, peekaboo from uh, the Lake Compounds Carousel, and they're very bold, very strong, very primary um, colors. There's a little bit of you know light, lighter colors in here, but we we tend to stick to the reds, the blues, um, the very patriotic, very American, um, or unless um, a client asks us to do something different. But um, a lot of times they ask us to do these very you know primary color um, color palettes, so we try to stick to that. And um, there was something I was gonna say. Oh, and at, over over time, we are finding that as they remove, you know, the leads and the other things, or change, or um, you know, these are these materials in their recipes are changing. So we are finding that you have to kind of adjust. It's not always a sure thing that when you open that that paint can is going to be the same as the royal blue or permanent blue that you had from last month or two, you know, a quarter um, ago. And uh, so you kind of have to be flexible and and work with them on that. Um, I think I threw this one in there because I was going to talk about how we don't blend colors, but then we do things like that, you know, this, this is a horse from the Holyoke carousel. Um, and just, um, you know, some more like non traditional colors, the pinks and the greens. Um, and then cleanup, you know, I think so many times it you, you forget that like after you do all this wonderful stuff, 
you got to clean up. And so um, I put, I don't, I actually didn't take any pictures. I never take pictures of people cleaning up, but, you know, I think the cleanup and the setup is, you know, the preparation and the cleanup is the most important. You know, if you're investing in, you know, these brushes and th this material, you know, take the time to clean your materials properly um, so that when you want to do a, a horse, like the, like a white bushnell, you know, lead horse, um, you're not using brushes that are dirty, that have, you know, split ends and things like that. You want to make sure that you're that you're properly taking care of all of those things and I can share some of the the um, cleaners that we use we use a lot of non-toxic cleaners and things like that at the museum and then overcoat so we um, finish the horses depending on their purpose and what is happening so these are some outside row pieces from uh, Sunny's Place PTC 72 and you know they're going back on a ride and so they are um, overcoated with a very heavy, um, you know, protective overcoat that is almost um, a similar um, material that you would find for like an auto body. It's not the same recipe, but it's, it's similar. And it goes on with, you know, a spray gun and it, you know, it, it cures and um, it's a very, um, great way to protect them, but it does leave them with a very shiny, glossy um, look. It's not a matte finish like a Jane's Carousel or, you know, um, you know, so it, it does have some drawbacks. It also, um, the overcoat finish I find tends to flatten some of the texture out and some of the painting as well as some of the leafing. So it's a, it's a trade-off. It's, you know, uh, depends on, um, you know, what your goals are. Are we looking to keep this preserved and keep it going? Or is it, you know, is it going in someone's home where they really want to appreciate the artistic um, aspects of it? Um, this is a piece, this is actually a Stein and Goldstein. It actually came to us in many pieces. You can see, we call them basket cases. Um, but he, we, we got him back together and he actually is a barber chair, a Stein and Goldstein barber chair, but he came to us in original paint. And obviously we did not do anything to his paint. We just kind of secured anything that might've been like chipping down, chipping up and peeling off and, you know, secured that down, but we didn't put, you know, obviously any kind of surface treatment on this. And then this is a loof donkey that is owned by Crescent Park Carousel. He also came to us in a variety of pieces. And again, he was, um, he got a matte finish because we knew that people were going to be near him, but not riding him. And so we wanted to give him a little bit of protection, but, you know, we didn't want to have a heavy, thick, um, you know, uh, you know, protective glossy overcoat on him. But I, I have heard that people like to pet his nose and that he's wearing a little thin on his nose. So we might have to go touch him up. And that's it. If you guys have any questions or would like a list of the materials that we use, I'm happy to email them to you, but uh, that's what I got. Thank you so much, Morgan. Mm -hmm. That was a great presentation. And one of the first questions is actually for you. Oh. So, um, Anyone listening, if you want to ask a question, please drop it in the Q&A or drop it down in the chat. And Morgan, for you, it is, when you apply the shellac, is it sprayed as is the kills? No, actually, that's a really great question, Dale. No, we um, we find that we can brush, we brush that on. Um, that hasn't been an issue, although, um, you know, I'm sure at some point if it went on too thick, you would probably get some brush strokes through, but I, we haven't found an issue with brushing it on. And this one's to everyone. What over, what overcoat product is this? Oh, actually, Morgan, it's probably for you. Um, was that the shiny one? If it's the shiny one, we actually have an auto body guy that comes that comes to the museum, and he has a special recipe that I don't even know what it is. So <laughs> it's a. Uh, I'm sure it's uh, I'm sure it's something with like an extra hardener in it. But he he comes in. It. It's a it's a specialty thing, and it's very interesting because there was one time he um, he came and or he came and had somebody else do it, and you could tell that it was very. It, the, the surface was very different. So, um, mm -hmm. but saying that I should probably get the recipe for that in case something happens to Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Rosa, I'm sorry. I was just curious how Rosa protects hers. What do you, what kind of surface treatment do you use on yours? Cause I know that you, that's not something that you use. Well, I don't know what that was, but <laughs> my husband's doing something. It sounded like a tire exploding. He liked pipes. <laughs> um, I use a varnish and always have. 
Um, and right now, the varnish that I was using went out of production. It's like everything else, you know, these things keep going away. You get used to using them and then, and then they stop making them. Um, so the one that I'm using right now is from Deft, D-E-F-T. And um, it is called, what is it called? It's a poly, it's a oil-based polyurethane. Okay. Yep. And I don't spray anything. I brush everything on. Yeah. So uh, it seems to work uh, really well. And I am afraid, I'm, I would like to know more about your automotive finish. I'm kind of afraid of those, um, but I would like to know more about them. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the difficult part is that it's not something that, you know, we have a lot of control over and it can be very temperamental because it's humidity, you know, we don't, we don't have- It feels like it has to be sprayed. Yeah. I, don't have, I have no spraying. Yeah, so. yeah. And that tends to be a pinch point for us in, you know, getting things, you know, completed and turned over because when it's out of our hands and it's something that is very difficult for us, it's, yeah. you know, we have to rely on somebody else's schedule, so- yeah. yeah, it's it seems like I agree. There's always this like as soon as you get used to using a product, it either changes its formula or is out of business or they got bought by somebody else and now it's not as good. <laughs> I've always thought that paint and varnish is a compromise. I mean, it doesn't matter what you use, you're compromising something. Yeah. Um, I, I have never found what I thought was perfect, especially varnish. Yeah. All right. Um does your overcoat tend to yellow over time? Ours does. Ours does not. With the spray, we've 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 had really great luck with that. You know, not not yellowing because it isn't a. It's not a, another. Well, I'm sure it's a chemical of some sort, but it seems to lay on top rather than getting absorbed into the wood. Mm. So we haven't really had. The, and I don't know if that's a combination of the shellac with the with the primer then the paint and then the overcoat so i don't know if that's enough of a barrier to keep it from from tinting but we have not had that the only thing that i have found with that overcoat is really um is just kind of like the the flattening it really flattens down the texture and it flattens down the leafing and so we haven't really found a really great solution to that sort of you know it kind of just like flattens all of the texture we had a couple that um, that did a little yellowing, um, and it depended on what color it was on, mm. and uh, not many of them, uh, not enough to you know be um, upset about or anything like that. But you could see the difference in the coloring. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Helen, do you have a picture of the completed buffalo carousel with you? Oh, I thought you might ask that. <laughs> <laughs> and of course I don't. I'm so sorry. But you can go and look on their website and on their Facebook and you'll find lots of great pictures. Of yes, that. yes, please. Next time I do one of these, I'll be better prepared. Right. <laughs> All right, now here's this one. How do you keep your paint thin during the process of painting? And do you find that as the can remains open, it becomes thicker as you use it? Go for it, Rosa. That's Rosa. There you go. There's Buffalo. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. There we go. That's beautiful. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Nice. All of the, um, um, the boards on the top, the um what do they call them rounding, rounding boards. boards yes <laughs> those oh. um were, were painted by four different artists we only chose four artists to do those so that we would um have more of a continuity about uh the type of paintings that were done beautiful such a beautiful such a beautiful piece and Rosa did all of our inner paintings on the inside, all of those, and they're, they're stunning. It's really beautiful. The answer to the question about paint and cans getting thick 
the way to remedy that is to take out the paint that you want to use and put it in uh, an unwaxed cup. You can get these little bathrooms, that's what I do, little bathroom cups. Mm -hmm. If you take it out and close your, your can back and keep your can lid clean, then it lasts longer. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Take it out, decant it, I guess that's what you would call it. <laughs> yeah, we use, we use a, a paint palette, like a wax paint palette. Mm -hmm. And, and just put, you know, we just a little bit of, you know, just scoop out what you need because so much paint goes so far. Yeah, um, it really, really does. Mm -hmm. um, we, we find that, you know, with the quartz, um, the quartz dry up faster than we can, we can use them. Um, but we did just recently buy a paint shaker, which has been helping. Um, um, to like, like an actual, like industrial thing that you'd find at Home Depot. Yeah. <laughs> so we had to like, we had to like bolt it. Cause like one day I was walked around and it was like shaking across the table. <laughs> like, you gotta bolt that thing down. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've, that's something that we struggle with too.